Section 11.5 is the chain rule. This is a nice uh, computationally intense section, um, but a lot of these rule, a lot of what we see will make sense. It'll look a lot like the chain rule from Calc 1. Only now, uh, there's some nuance to it. We've got more than one variable to deal with for these functions. So the chain rules can be a little bit more delicate. There is one overarching chain rule that we'll learn in the end instead of the first two cases. It subsumes both of those two cases. But to start and get a feel for it, this first case is, uh, is our basic one. Um, we have a function f of x of t of y of t. We just think of this as being a, a function of two variables, f of x, y. And then it'll just happen that x is a function of t and y is a function of t. So our functions are nested. And we, not only are they nested, but each of our two variables are functions of a variable t. Um, and we'll see other situations for even more uh, dependency on more variables than just t and, and sort of higher dimensional things happening. But for now, let's do a function of two variables, each of those variables depending on a variable t. So we say that x is some function g of t, y is some function h of t. If they're both differentiable functions of t, then z is also differentiable as a function of t and dz dt, which is just a normal derivative, or df dt, we might think about it that way as well, is equal to something that looks a lot like the chain rule. We have df dx times dx dt. So the derivative of the function in the first variable x, or the partial of the partial derivative of the function in the first variable x, times the derivative of the first variable x with respect to t. And then that's plus the derivative, the partial derivative of f in the second variable y times the derivative of y with respect to t. So this overall function will be a function of t. So that's why it's an ordinary derivative dz dt. It just happens to work out that way. This is the only case where that's going to, the overall derivative is a, an ordinary derivative and not a, a partial derivative. Okay, the proof of this uses the, the plain equation for the linearization equation that we saw back in 11.4 with planes and tangent planes. Um, we don't really need to get into the details of that. The book provides a nice, a nice uh, description of that, a nice breakdown for the proof if that is uh, desired. But let's just see how to work with this at first. So we're asked to calculate dz dt for the function z equals cosine of x plus 4y and where x is equal to 5 times t to the fourth and y is equal to 1 over t. So let's put together a few pieces. We know that we're going to need dx dt and dy dt, so we'll calculate that. We'll also need the partial of f with respect to x, the partial of f with respect to y. In this case, that's dz dx and dz dy. And those are all written down below here. So it looks like we started by writing down the formula that we'll use for this to get dz dt. That's good. From here, dx dt, 5t to the fourth, gives us 20t cubed as a derivative. Similarly for y equals 1 over t, or y equals t to the negative 1. Now the partial of f or z with respect to x is differentiating this function as a partial derivative with respect to x. So that's negative sine of x plus 4 times 1, because that's the derivative of x plus 4, okay, using the chain rule um, well in, within the cosine's nested function, within cosine's argument. So df dy, similar way, outer derivative is negative sine, and the inner derivative, x plus 4y, partial with respect to y, gives us a constant of 4. And that's what gives us df dy. Now, moving off to the right, we can put all these things together. We've got all the components of this formula listed here. So we plug those into that formula. And this is the result. What we'll do for these types of problems um, is we'll just leave a mix of variables in there. Of course, x plus 4y, t plus 4y can be expressed as functions of t. But typically, what we'll want to do is find these values numerically. And it could be a nice shortcut to just leave these as x and y and solve for what they would be as numbers if we're given some prescribed t value. So it's just convention that the book and most of the problems we'll do to start here 
at least using this case one chain rule, will be uh, a mix of variables in t and x and y. Um, so that's, that'll be sufficient for those kinds of problems. So that's uh, the beginning of this. Um, just It's definitely tricky to keep track of these things. We're gonna see some methods to do so. Let's see the, the next case though. So this is where we have a function f of a var variables x and y, but now each of those variables x and y depends on two variables themselves, s and t. So we can start to see where this would become a little bit more difficult, a little bit more uh, crowded with terms and a little bit more difficult to keep track of. So if z is equal to this function f of x, y of two variables and x is g of s of t and y is a function of s, of s and t as well, and everything is differentiable, we'll just assume all the functions involved in these situations are differentiable. Then f overall or z overall is differentiable with respect to s and the partial of z with respect to s is given by the following. This looks a lot like the first page by no surprise. Um, these are now partials though because x is a function of s and t so we've got to speak about which, which variable we're taking a derivative in and that's when the partial derivative comes about. Similarly dz dt exists, dz dt down here and again, we have partials here, but essentially this is the same as what we saw with the previous case, only now this thing can fork into dz, dz ds or dz dt based on the fact that these are our basic or most basic variables in the situation. So our, our deepest independent variables, we'll say. So now we have problem that asks us to find dz dt and dz ds, part, both partial derivatives of z with respect to t and with respect to s. We're given that z is the arc sine of x minus y. We're told that x equals s squared plus t squared, y equals one minus two s t. And in this situation, just to show it, I've decided to, to write everything down in terms of s and t. Again, that's not necessary for these types of functions. We can leave them mixed by convention in the textbook and answering homework problems. Um, definitely read what any problem might require of you in terms of the form of your answer. So below what we have is ds, dz ds to begin with. And this is, well, we'll have to put some pieces together. One thing we have to remember is that when we take the derivative of z, which is arc sine, you just have to recall what arc sine's derivative is. So the ordinary derivative of arc sine off to the right here is just, if it's arc sine of x, it's equal to one over root one minus x squared. So one over root one minus the argument of arc sine squared, okay? So that's exactly what has happened over here on the right. Only now x minus y is playing the role of x, and this is where it fits into this expression. Okay, we know that for dz ds, partial of z with respect to s, that this is dz dx, and here's dz dx in this case, times dx ds, partial of x with respect to s, and that came from finding the partial of x with respect to s here. It just gives us 2s, remember t squared is a constant, so it differentiates to zero with respect to the partial s. So that's the first term, very similar. We have dz dy here, using the same rule that we used below. And dy ds is this term here, differentiating y with respect to s as a partial. So one differentiates to zero and we have negative two times t because s differentiates to one with, with respect to partial s. So putting all that together and then substituting x equals this and y equals this expression for, for these components here, we have this down in the denominator. Again, this is not necessary, but just to see it and just to know that it's possible, um, I've done this in this example to show. It's probably most of the time I think that these answers will be sufficient right here in this form. Just pay attention to what's being asked in each problem. Now for dz dt, again, something similar, we'll have dz dx and dz dy, so those will look the same. Um, in this case, 
I've got dz dx and dz dy are the same thing, um, except for minus sign, and that minus sign is actually right here for the uh, dz dy component. Okay, now taking this a little bit further, we've got to take the derivative uh, of uh, to be a little more clear about what is happening down here. This is dx dt, partial x with respect to t, and this is partial of y with respect to t. And this negative one actually came from, it's part of um, the derivative of partial derivative of z with respect to y. And what it is, is it's the, the chain rule that came from taking the derivative of x, the partial derivative of x minus y with respect to y as a partial. Okay, so to clarify that, it's all just been condensed into one, one uh, expression there to make it a little bit faster. And then again, in this one, I have taken the x minus y, substituted what x and y are in into, as functions of s and t, just to emphasize that when we're done with these things, these functions here are actually functions of variables s, t, just to demonstrate that. Again, though, um, these answers are allowed to mix variables, and it should be clear what, you, what you're being asked for. So that is a function of two variables, each of those variables being a function of two more variables. This we can see can continue on for any number of variables to begin with, and it could be any number of variables uh, that the next layer of variables depends on. So that's what the next theorem sort of spells out for us, and we'll see an example to help us keep track of these sorts of partial derivatives and what's going on with all these, tra with all these tr uh, chain rules. So, yeah, extending this into functions of three or more variables, uh, higher dimensions is another way to say that. Um, so suppose that u is a differentiable function of the n variables x1 to xn. So instead of saying x, y, z, where we run out of letters, we're saying x1 and we're going to count them. Each of those xi, x1, x2 to xn, is another independent variable um, that, is, uh, that u is a function of. u is differentiable in those. And each xj happens to be a differentiable function of m variables t1 through tm. So now each of these x's can be a function of all of these t's, okay, t1 through tm. So these are taking the place of t and s so we don't run out of letters, and we're numbering them 1 through m. Notice that n and m don't have to be the same numbers, so that's nice. Um, we can have any kind of general functions uh, nested within each other. And the overall derivative of this is for any d sub ti, so ds, dt, d, whatever, you know, whatever, uh, whatever bottom layer variable we're, we're interested in, the partial of u with respect to that variable is it's just a string of what we've seen already, du, dx1, u and its first component, x1, times partial of the first component with respect to ti. Now notice that that ti matches here. It's just like the s's matched in case two and the t's matched in case two as well. Okay, and that continues on for the rest of the components of this function. And we'll have n of these sums for, n of these terms in the sum for all the independent variables of the function u, x1 through xn, okay? And going down the list, we would realize that, well, that's just for one of our t sub i variables here. So there would be m rows that would look like this, m partial derivatives of u to come up with, d partial u with respect to t1, partial u with respect to t2, partial u with respect all the way up to tm. So that's how we'd get m lines that would look like that. So there could be quite a bit of computation to go on. There could be quite a bit of uh, ways to lose track of actually what's happening here. So we have this tree diagram, and the next problem is asking us to use the tree diagram to write out the chain rule for the given differentiable functions. So all the functions we're given here we assume are differentiable. We're told that r is a function of x, y, z, and t, so it's a function of four variables, 
and x is a function of u and v, y is a function of u and v, z is the same, and t is also a function of u and v. So in order to keep track of all these things, we start with our topmost function, our apex. Okay, we know that r is a function of x, it's a function of y, z, and t. So this is how we'll form our tree. Then we know that each of those variables, x, y, z, and t, are functions of u and v. So x is a function of u and v, and u and v, for all four of those variables, each of those is a function of u and v. So we keep forking this tree down. If u and v were functions of other variables, we could continue with this. Now, along the lines, just to keep track of partial derivatives, and the real reason for having this uh, tree diagram of dependencies is to be able to come up with our partial derivatives. So there's r with respect to x partial, partial x with respect to u, or partial x with respect to v. There's r with, with respect to y partial, partial y with respect to u, so on. We can read all of these off. If we wanted to find the partial of r with respect to u, we would trace the path to u from r down to u in all of these cases. So it would be this times this one. And then as we move across, we'll sum things. This one times this one, dr dy times dy du. Uh, dr partial r with respect to z, partial z with respect to u. And then partial r with respect to t times partial t with respect to u. Multiply everything down the tree and then add up all those products. And that's exactly what we see in the line the first answer here for dr du, we have multiplied down the line to get this product right here, again for this one, and so on for the rest of them. And then we've added up across those products to come up with the total, um, well, to come up with the partial derivative of r with respect to u. Do the same thing for v. Travel the path until we get to v. Travel these paths till we get to v. And we end up with the same, multiplying down the paths and then adding up those multiples. So that's how the tree diagram might help us if we're having trouble keeping track of things. One thing that I always like to think of is you basically put together all the products for which if we had some kind of cancellation here, the dx's would cancel and you'd get dr over du. You see the same thing happening here, dr du, partial r, partial u, and uh, you know, it's that we don't actually ever do that cancellation, but it's how the chain rule often appears. And it's a nice way to recognize that you're doing the chain rule correctly, most likely. So that's a tree diagram to guide us. And that's the general case. We can take um, partial derivatives of functions of many variables and we're sort of unlimited in what we can do in that case with two layers of dependency. In other words, two, set, two layers of the tree here. Now let's see what we can do with implicit differentiation. Of course, we can do this a more direct method that we've already learned in partial derivatives. But there's also a formula around that, make, that can make things uh, a little bit more convenient for us if we choose to, to work through that. So suppose we have a function f of x, y equals zero, and it defines y implicitly as a differentiable function of x. In other words, y is equal to some little f of x. And we could, if we were able to somehow solve for it explicitly, right, f of x comma little f of x equals zero. So, you know, we want to be, always be able to find that, that uh, lowercase, that little f of x function. So we'll have to use implicit differentiation if we wanted to find dy dx, the derivative of y with respect to x in a situation like this. So what we'll do is we'll differentiate this function, f of x, y equals zero, or this equation, with respect to x on both sides. And what we find is that we have partial of f with respect to x, and then chain rule tells us the derivative of x with respect to x. It's an ordinary derivative because, well, we're thinking of it in a way that x depends on x here, so which is kind of an odd thing to say. X depends on x in the sense that it is x, right? So that's kind of a, an odd way to write that and then y depends on x as a function, f of x. So it's a single variable, just like t in the first case of what we saw in this set of notes, in this uh, 
section. So we have ordinary derivatives that come out of the side. Uh, X and Y don't depend on more than one variable, in other words. So then second component of this is partial of F with respect to Y times the derivative of Y with respect to X. All that's equal to zero on the right because the derivative of zero is just zero. So we've got this expression. If we solve for dy dx, we're going to have, well, and also recognize that dx, the derivative of x with respect to x is one. So that kind of falls out pretty easily. It's just a constant of one. When we solve for dy dx, we've got partial of f with respect to x over partial of f with respect to y. And there's a even more concise notation for doing that, and that's this right here. Partial f with respect to x part over partial f with respect to y, quantity is negative. So, okay. Let's look at an example of this. I think that's sufficient for remembering that, or for coming up with that formula. Um, again, you don't have to remember that formula. This, the next example after this one, I will do without that formula. So it'll be nice to see that you don't just always need to plug things into formulas. There are, you know, we can use the old style implicit derivative, implicit differentiation methods for doing this as well. But every now and then, uh, you know, it doesn't hurt to be faster with a formula. So we're given uh, the equation cosine xy equals one plus sine y. And we're asked to find dy dx for the function, function y that is implicitly defined by, uh, as a function of x. So find dy dx from this equation, basically. So what we do is we move all of this over to one side. So it looks like I've subtracted cosine xy from both sides, renamed my function f of xy this, noting that all of this is really equal to zero. Not that that's critical but just making it match what we see above. And then to find dy dx, the derivative of y with respect to x, we just implement the formula that we're given. That's this one here. F, uh, partial f with respect to x over partial f with respect to y, all negative. And partial f with respect to x, uh, this is zero, this is zero because they're constants, and then this is gonna become positive sine of xy times y. That's exactly what we have right here. Similarly, we find the partial derivative of f with respect to y. This is zero, this is cosine y, and this one is respectively positive sine xy times x. Now we have f sub x, f sub y, partial f with yeah, both partials, plug them into the formula, and we've got our implicit derivative dy dx is equal to this function, implicit function of y uh, given here. And that's that for one of these using the formula. Now we have three variables. Let's see some implicit differentiation in that case. We also have formulas again. These are derived in a very similar way. Um, again, note that uh, for starting with a function of three variables, and we're thinking about z being defined as a function of x and y now, so in other words, we can solve for z and from all the other variables in this function, or we could think about how it is implicitly defined by those other variables, even if we can't solve for it, so that we have a function that looks something like this overall. Then we can talk about z's implicit derivative. Now though, it's with respect to x and it's with respect to y. So we can find the derivative of z with respect to x and the derivative of z with respect to y. That's why the formulas we have at the bottom here are partials, partial z with respect to x, partial z with respect to y. Uh, the steps above walk us through how the, the formula or how this formula is derived. It's not particularly uh, uh, difficult to follow along with, so I'll leave it to the reader to do so. And we arrive at the two formulas we have down at the bottom here. The textbook might also provide some further details here. But still, as I said before, you don't really even need the formulas. You can just use standard old implicit differentiation if uh, that works for you. So let's see that in the last example. I put a little note over here on how to do the formula method in this case, but it's very similar to the example I just did, only now we're finding this for partials which is not much different than the other one. So find partial z with respect to x and partial z with respect to y for the implicit function given by this equation. Okay, 
So we can just do this the way we've always done it. And maybe the formula is a little nicer because it's a little cleaner. In fact, if you do follow this out, maybe it will come out a little bit more cleanly. But if you don't want to learn more formulas, why not just do this the way that we've always done this? So we have partial of x with respect, partial with respect to x of this side, partial with respect to x of this side of the equation. When we're done, what we're going to do is we'll try to solve for dz dx wherever it shows up. Okay, so in this case, we've got partial with respect to x of x, y, z on the left. And just to make things a little bit easier, what I've done is I factored out y. And why would I do that? Because y is just a constant with respect to this situation, right? Um, z is implicitly a function of x. And x is, well, it's the variable of interest that we're differentiating for. So those two stay together, and we'll need to carry out a product rule. y is just a constant with, in terms of the partial with respect to x. So it just floats out front while we carry out a product rule in the line below. Now, on the right-hand side of the equation, what's happening? Well, we've begun this differentiation process. We've taken the partial with respect to x of cosine of x plus y plus z. Now what's left is to take the partial with respect to x of the inner function. Okay, this is just the, uh, the old style chain rule, the, the old school chain rule. So our product rule here is, well, this is the result of this product rule. This is the derivative with respect to x of x times z. This is the derivative with respect to x of z times x y was just sitting out front the whole time it's been factored back into these okay it's a little bit more delicate maybe the formula makes more sense to use but you don't need it and this is just showing that you actually don't the formula you could check these problems with the formula just as well if you like and you'll see that we get the same value it might even be that much easier but anyway um, in this case on the right hand side that's differentiating partial derivative with respect to x of those three things. Remember, y is a constant, so it differentiates to zero. x goes to one, and we have dz dx. The rest of this is a matter of collecting all terms with dz dx in them. That's happened here. And then we divide by this coefficient in front of dz dx. These are non-dz dx terms over here on the right. And the result is this rational, rational expression on the right. It's not quite a rational function because those aren't polynomials in the denominator and numerator. So that's one of them, dz dx. Similarly, we do the same um, with this line, partial with respect to y. And x now is going to be our constant because it is not implicitly a function of y. z is implicitly a function of y. And y is the variable of interest in this derivative. So those stay inside while the x would factor out and just show up as a constant times the chain rule of y times z for the partial d dy. Now, on the right-hand side, well, this is very similar to what we had above, only now y survived and differentiated to one, and we have dz dy. Again, carrying out very similar steps to the above, we end up with this rational expression here for dz dy, and we're done with that. Very similarly, we could use a formula for this one as well, and you can confirm with that formula that you get the same answer. So two different ways to do this implicit, these implicit derivatives. We've seen the, uh, the introductory case and the second case for uh, the chain rules and multivariate functions, and then we saw the general case, which means we can differentiate any of these functions with any dependencies of variables as long as all of our given functions are differentiable. So there's a lot to practice. Uh, do all the problems in the textbook for this section. Really learn your way through these. Use that tree when you need to. And good luck.